นโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิสัจจะนันโดเมื่อเช้านี้วันนี้จะเป็นเพลินและอบอุ่นที่จะได้รับการต้อนรับกลับไปที่บายกิริและจะมีการทำมุกดิตาให้กับงานที่ได้รับการทำมุกดิตาให้กับงานที่ได้รับการทำมุกดิตา Look at the finished buildings, the finished shrines, the details here and there. All the thought that's gone into everything, all the work, as uh, in uh, in temple in New Hampshire where we're establishing a monastery now, we, we have it all ahead of us, and uh, that's a thought in the mind right now, which can feel heavy if we. Uh, hold it in a particular way, or not? If we see it for what it is, it's a thought in the mind right now. In fact, the experience of living it for us, living it at a temple, temple forest monastery, is very pleasant. Every day we are there. Almost we uh, comment on how how lucky we. We are to live in a beautiful place with uh, good people, good monks, good lay people, a community of like-minded practitioners. And this is the this is the real monastery. Um, the buildings support the monastery. They aren't the monastery itself. In a, one way of uh, looking at it. The real uh, monastery is in our heart, in our own mind, so that we uh, we can be <coughs> in a monastery and not really uh, not really be living in a physical monastery, but not really be living in a monastery if we're um, you know thinking about worldly things or. <clears throat> forgetting the whole reason why we came in the first place, and then we can actually take the monastery with us when we physically leave. You know, on the other hand, we can not be in the physical monastery and yet live in the monastery in our our hearts and our minds. So it's really up to us what we make of uh, our lives, and in terms of what the. Uh, <clears throat> You know the structures that we we build physically, and the structures that we internalize, that we take on mentally, intellectually, perceptions that we develop uh, through reading teachings and contemplating them. These are up to us, and and they are only as good as they affect us. So we have a way of um, life that we are constantly. Choosing and forming, whatever our circumstances, some of you may not be able to uh, live the particular lifestyle you ideally would like to. Perhaps maybe there are family obligations or other obligations or other limitations which prevent that. Those of us in the monastery, we've chosen this way of life, and yet it's never going to be exactly what we think it should be. It's the only thing you know when you become a monk is that it's not going to be what you expect, and the uh, um, reality of that is a reality of being human, of living in this world, living in in samsara. Is is it's never going to be what we want it to be, even if it is, then it changes, 
and we don't want it to change, so it, it isn't what we want it to be. So we have a way of <clears throat> making choices that form our experience. We, we have a life that we, um, uh, we cultivate, whether we know it or not. And so the, the Buddha's emphasis on practices that encourage mindfulness and awareness and tranquility, clear seeing, is one that um, helps us do just that. We, we, we clearly, or more clearly, see the reality uh, of our experience. And that's the, the main, um, you know, the main thing which is going to help in the end. Uh, we have a, uh, also the emphasis to avoid doing, saying and thinking things which are going to cause suffering. And that's important. And we have the encouragement to cultivate um, mind states and, and uh, say, verbal habits and, and ways of, of being with each other and, and living our lives which have beneficial results. So they're wholesome actions, body, speech, and mind. That's going to help. And yet the particular Buddhist offering and, and, and opportunity the Buddha really wanted us to discover for ourselves, each of us, is based not just on avoiding the unpleasant and the harmful and cultivating the, say, spiritually or, or psychologically, emotionally pleasant and the beneficial from a, 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 the point of view of kamma, but rather it's to go deeper than that and to really clearly see uh, what the reality of our life is, what the reality of our experience is as a human being. So the emphasis on using these uh, ways of looking at um, our experience that are contained in, say, teachings about what we call the five khandhas, um, uh, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vijnana, or form and feeling and <clears throat> perception, and say sankara, hard to define, but mental fabrication, you could say, all that goes with the worlds we build through our in our minds and through our our personal histories. And when Yana sense consciousness, that which we hear and see, smell, taste, feel in our bodies, and everything our mind does with all that, these ways of looking at our experience, which are, uh, say, ancient ways, the ways that existed already at the time of the Buddha, which he uh, adopted and encouraged us to, to use, they can help us just take ourselves out of our ordinary um, way of perceiving ourselves and our life and start to see it more clearly as it really is. And we have these phrases like, as it really is, as it truly is, um, reality. And what does that mean? Is it some, you know, some spiritual reality that we haven't seen yet that we need to, to um, you know, uh, find through special meditation practices or um, some higher beings going to bless us with a vision of. People have all kinds of ideas of what enlightenment might mean, what reality with a capital R might mean. But reality uh, is, doesn't need to be something which is far away from us and unattainable in terms of perception but rather a way of just looking more clearly, looking from a different angle at what's already happening here in our ordinary life. So we have these ways that the Buddha encouraged to start to see our experience right now in the present moment, not just in terms of, you know, I'm sitting here in the Dhamma Hall asked to give a talk, and you're sitting here in the Dhamma Hall at a bike, Giri, maybe you've driven here, Maybe you've 
you're spending the night, maybe you've been many times, maybe if this is your first time, or maybe you're a monk and here you are, and you know, you're thinking about um, this talk, or you're thinking about, you know, the Bindabat tomorrow, or the work project that has to go on, or the monastery you're going to be able to visit when you finally get to five Vasas and can go to Thailand. Right? We all have our own lives, and we sit here experiencing ourselves as we've formed our perceptions, but we don't notice necessarily that that's all they are, actually. It's not me and it's not, it's not what's happening. It's not reality. What's reality is that that's a perception that I have. It's my idea of what a Bayagiri is, my idea of what this hall is. I have to have it, otherwise I'll go crazy if I just see it as color and shape. If I just hear sound as sound and I, I don't uh, use my memory to understand that sound, it's crickets and the sound of my voice. So we have to live in the world that we create, but we can also see clearly that the reality is, it is a world that we create. That sound that we hear, that's crickets outside, is a sound. And that's all it is, it's, that's just a sound. And it's perception or sanya that tells me it's crickets. I don't really even know that it's crickets. Maybe it's some special Redwood Valley insect that just sounds like a cricket. Maybe it's someone outside with some speakers trying to fool us that there are actually crickets out there. Right? We don't really know, we, but there's a sound. And it's likely. It is what it seems to be. We've been around long enough. Not to get fooled too many times by simple things like that. Yet the reality is, it's just sound. And everything on top of that, crickets, and then the fabrications that come on top of that, the stories around it. I like crickets. They always made me feel peaceful when I was a kid. It makes me think of going to see the folk concerts with my parents and the New Hampshire summers. All that sankara, it's added on. It's usually unconscious or semi-conscious, but it affects the mood, the emotion affects the feeling of personality. Maybe that was a good time, so it makes me feel confident and warm. Maybe that was a scary time, so it makes me feel unsure, afraid. Right? All the time we're building a world, and it's to do with, yes, our experience up till now, so the habits we've formed and the, the conditions that have gone before conditioning this moment now. But what's happening now is just this, always. So we're encouraged to clearly see it for what it is. And using the khandhas as a way of, of helping us uh, focus with this, this lens of a uh, different kind of clarity can help us get a perspective on the way that we are being with it, the way that we're getting caught by it, the way that we're getting pushed around by our own fears and wants, hopes and dreams, assumptions. Well, the habits will still be there. We can't really be free until we see, that, see them for what they are, their habits. And they're arising every moment now and then again now. And they depend really on conditions. And we know this, we start to come to monasteries and hear teachings, or we open books, and we, we, however it is that we learn about Buddhist teachings, so we, we can start to understand this intellectually, and that's, that's helpful. That helps us have a certain level of insight, which can deepen on its own, just through uh, our intellectual understanding. And yet, the clear seeing of reality as reality, just now, just this, is something which we can only do if we uh, are able to move out of our thinking 
and our conceiving into a kind of direct knowing, a direct uh, observing. So we hear a lot, don't we, about mindfulness, awareness, sati, sati, sampajanya, sati, panya. Samadhi helps calm the mind, collect the mind so that we're not being distracted and can see more clearly. Things can be see, seen more deeply. The mud in the water of our awareness starts to settle to the bottom because we're not stirring it up by acting in ways that cause remorse, guilt. So the whole path is, is there to help us clearly see we are able to uh, then we have this opportunity if we wish to, to, to understand through seeing, through, through, through knowing directly, observing, how we get caught by suffering. When I make myself into someone who has to succeed, I suffer to a, to a degree. When I make myself into someone who needs to be seen in a, in a good light by other people and not be seen in a bad light, I suffer. We all do this because we're social animals, unless we've you know somehow you know succeeded in, in in releasing ourselves from that conditioning in one way or another. We'll have other ways we make ourselves suffer. So it's not wrong. We don't actually even need to stop the feeling of wanting others to see us, you know, uh, in, in 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 a good light to use that example. But if we're caught into it in a way where we really believe it, that's reality, then we really do suffer. We become the suffering. If we see it for what it is, that's the way my mind is wired to work because of conditions. It's not me. It's really just the mind doing that right now. Then it doesn't feel pleasant, maybe. Maybe this emotion, emotional reaction still comes, but it's not, it's actually not much to do with me. It's just chemistry, you know, put me in this situation with a bunch of people and that's what's going to happen. So we have a way of starting to see ourselves, which is less personal and therefore more freeing. It's not dissociative. We're not trying to run away from ourselves or change ourselves or distance ourselves from what we feel but rather just see those feel, feelings for what they are and not make them into something that they aren't. Me. So I've got to make the feelings right because it's me. Otherwise I'm wrong. So then it's, it's less, of a, less, of, less of a project to make myself into the good one, the perfect one, the right one, the one I want to be, the one I hope to be. Don't have to even do any of that. Just keep myself out of trouble. Don't, you know, don't steal, don't kill, don't lie, don't, you know, take other people's partners, keep myself sane and sober, stay out of trouble and learn, watch, develop mindfulness through practicing sila, practicing samadhi, and therefore, then banya can arise. We, the wisdom comes naturally, not through reading, although that can help, but through directly observing. We don't even need to be intelligent on, in a conventional sense, because it's a different wisdom is, isn't dependent on it in, on intelligence the way that our current uh, society understands that word. It's more dependent on uh, balance. There are many really intelligent people totally out of balance. Some of them, you know, building bombs. And there's some people who are very, uh, you know, couldn't tell you what 
two plus two equals maybe. And yet, very wise. So we start to value the innate capacity we have for wisdom. And we, we create places like this monastery, like a Bayagiri, not as some, you know, not as ends in themselves, but as a means to protect and, and encourage um, the cultivation of this, this path, which is a path available to any of us, whether we're monks or nuns or, or not. As long as we're human and can understand enough to start to look for ourselves, then we have the chance to be free. So we, we, uh, we do our best and we look at our experience in ways that make sense. And maybe for some, the five khandhas won't be as useful as for others. Instead, you know, start to cultivate the barmi, the barmitas, qualities like generosity, honesty, and determination. Maybe for some, just simply contemplating the Four Noble Truths will, will be enough. Understanding suffering, understanding the cause, what it is to be free of suffering, and then the path reveals itself. All aspects of our life. So the uh, ways that we are with each other are, are just as important as the ways that we are with ourselves. And the, the work we're doing and the way we're doing that work can be just as important as the meditation and any insights that seem to come from the meditation practice. Because it's all, it's all of our life, isn't it? It's not just um, something that happens when we're sitting full lotus. It may happen when we're sitting full, full lotus, if there's a big shift, but it also may happen when we're cleaning a toilet. It's something that happens as a capacity and a, 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 a potential that we have of coming back into balance, let's say, of, of uh, letting go, of, of being able to free ourselves from this unnecessary and yet um, you know, long established pattern of making ourselves suffer unnecessarily by making ourselves into somebody. So we don't want to just try not to be somebody because that, then we just, we go crazy and get confused. So how do we do it? It seems like a conundrum. How do we, how do we understand not self And the way to, 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 to really, you know, see the relativity and, uh, let's say, unreality of self is to, is to understand self. So we allow ourselves to feel what we feel. We allow ourselves to, to be who we are. We don't try to, you know, make ourselves into some kind of mindful automaton that doesn't you know, react emotionally and doesn't say anything about anything except Dhamma um, from the scripture. Um, I've met monks who've tried to be like that. They always disrobe or they change a lot and, and allow themselves to be more human and, and, uh, and then finally uh, practice in, in ways that, that work better. But generally, they, usually they disrobe. I remember one monk went coming into Amravati a long time ago, and he'd he'd read. Uh, he 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 was an Australian monk who'd be ordained in Thailand, and um, was visiting Amravati with uh, one of Ajahn Chah's disciples, in Bujan, as his attendant, and he was uh, just trying to be the perfect monk. And the way he was doing that, one aspect of it, was he'd read 
in the scriptures that the Buddha never like turned his head from side to side, never bent his neck. He'd always just kind of turn his whole body. If he would look to the side, he'd everything with the whole shoulders kind of would just shift over to the side and then everything to the whole shoulders would shift over to the left side if he looked left. So that's what he did. Whenever you asked him a question, he kind of would stiffly turn his entire body over to you. And <laughs> give you the perfect answer. He disrobed. You know, we, we can't understand through our, you know, our intellect and perceptions. It's not about, it's not about uh, forming ourselves into our ideas, but understanding this, understanding our actual experience. So the Buddha offered us ways of of engaging with the present moment, with our experience, our relationships with ourselves, our relationships with others. And there are things we can do, like cultivate wholesome qualities while we're working, while we're being with each other and speaking, and, and avoid that which is harmful, you know, uh, overriding or, or disengaging from our harmful habits. And, crucially, kind of specifically, in the Buddhist sense, what Buddhism offers that, that, that uh, is, is, or at least was unique, this way of seeing, which will allow us to see clearly you know, the reality of our experience. It's not what it seems to be. I am this body, right? Well, I wasn't this body 30 years ago. It was a lot more comfortable and energetic. I wasn't this body 50 years ago. It was a lot smaller, just tiny. Not one cell was the same. I was two, right? And yet there I was. So is this the same body? Is it me? No. So what's the same? I was certainly perceiving things differently when I was two. I can't remember how I was perceiving things, but I assume it was very different. What is it? You know, so we, we have ways of, of, we can contemplate like that, and that can help. But just by directly observing this now, in terms of the khandhas, in terms of, you know, form, the experience of form, the experience of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, neither, pleasant nor unpleasant, in terms of all of our sense experience, those aspects of it, Sanya, you know, the perceptions that we're, we're, we're putting on, so that's crickets, right? I see, I open my eyes, there's a bunch of color in front of me, color and shape, but it's perception that tells me those are cushions, those are people, those are lights, those are very big lights. I think that's what they are. <laughs> right? All I see is a big circle up there, it looks like a cake. <laughs> hanging from the ceiling. But I had a conversation the other day which lets me know those are lights. That's perception, right? And then it's sankara that comes in, so there's a whole lot in there too, this right, the perception of, of uh, a, a light engineer hired by an architect who was embarrassed at the size of the lights when the monks all made a surprised noise when they saw the designs and right and and then you know it's all stuff around that you don't like to make people feel embarrassed and then you have you so we all have our our, our world is created every moment 
But really it's just color and shape in terms of what I see. The rest is being added in. And it's not the, precisely the same. In fact, it might be very different between me and Ajahn Seksan and Lumpa Pasano and all of us here. So which is the right one? Which is the real one? It changes too. If we really watch, it'll be a little different tomorrow for me and for each of us. A little different the next day. The next moment, in fact, it's changing all the time. All of it is. So we watch clearly and, and, and start to see that we don't have to take it quite as seriously as, as we have been conditioned to do in terms of this project of me and my life and trying to get it right. Especially when we enter the Buddhist way, then we get this whole new project, enlightenment, Nibbana, succeeding, finishing our work. That's the, that's the euphemism in the forest tradition. His work is finished. Right? And, the, and it's good. We need those too. We can't just throw out the conventions, we'll go mad otherwise. Yet we need to be able, eventually at least, to see those conventions for what they are. They're not, they're not as real as they purport themselves to be. They're not anything other than what they are actually right now. Perception, mental fabrication, emotion, right? volition, Sight, sound, smell, taste, feeling in the body, what the mind is doing, all the thinking, perceiving. They overlap each other, these categories. And that'll be either pleasant or unpleasant, or neither. There's mind and body, form. We start to just keep checking in and looking and seeing in this moment. That's what that's what the experience is. This is what it is now. And then there's what my mind makes of it. Right? Builds me and my world. You, as I perceive you. And it expands out if we, if we you know, that tends to do that, depending on our, our habits, I suppose. If we're media consumers, then we've got a world of politics and, you know, Maybe it's local politics, maybe it's national politics, maybe it's geopolitics. But that's up to us. We carry it around. We create it. Or it's a, you know, the, 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 the myths of the, uh, the mytho, what's the right word? Not the, the mythology, you know, of the forest monk that we carry around with us. Very useful, very beautiful. Lumpu Man, Lumpu Cha, Lumpu Pasano. Right? We, we, have, we have our worlds, which, and they're functional. It's not really so important what we believe, because beliefs are all different, all relative except for how they affect us. They're important in the way that they affect us. So if we have a bunch of beliefs about Buddhism, that may be very good. But we have to check how are they actually affecting us. Maybe they're, they're, they're not so good in some ways. If we have beliefs around the world, politics, our social situation, family, friends, Maybe those affect us in a way which is beneficial. Maybe they affect us in a way which is harmful. So we just start to check. We see belief as belief. Perception as perception. And understand that the direction of the path is one away from uh, holding tightly and from following, blindly following desire, especially sense desire. And we see that for what it is. It, 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 it promises pleasure and in some ways actually leads to pain. We learn from watching ourselves, from observing, directly knowing this through awareness in the present moment. 
And we, we understand then more and more that the, the direction of the path is one of, of letting go, of putting down, of relief, of release, of coolness, of moving away from that direction. And then, you know, it's, it's a blessing that we can actually just keep it to this moment, just this. It's up to us how much we want to build. We're caught into it in a way we can't just let go because we want to and we can notice that. By noticing and seeing how we're caught, then letting go can arise through understanding over time. And we don't know when that time's gonna be. We don't know, we can't make it happen. We can't just let go because we want to let go. But we can cultivate the conditions for letting go to happen. So that's what we do. We, we, we try to be kind to each other, generous and as truthful as we can. We notice when we're hiding things from ourselves, from others, when we're afraid, we, we understand uh, more and more that that just leads to pain. So we don't stop doing it because we know we shouldn't or don't want others to see us in a bad light, but because we understand it's gonna simply keep us caught. So we move, we start to trust the path more and take, take refuge in the Buddha and Dhamma and Sangha on an experiential level by, uh, you know, it's, it's, we don't have to become something we're not. We have to see that we are not what we think we are and, and trust that. So those are a few words uh, this evening.